Uh, so yesterday, uh, a strange story was developed in which uh, we had, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the great uh, young uh, Bertrand Russell producing the principles of mathematics in 1903, probably the most important uh, treatise on uh, the philosophy of mathematics ever written. Important means uh, not, uh, it's not a judgment, it's, uh, it's a fact. It's uh, the wide variety of, uh, of his mind and the depth at the same time. You have the variety and going to the profound questions at the same time. So that was uh, the miracle of the young Bertrand Russell in 1903, the principles of mathematics. And then I presented also to you uh, a smaller miracle, but extremely interesting, and uh, uh, the work of uh, James B. Michaud, this uh, obscure professor from, from Ohio, in which uh, he produced one of the best uh, treatises also of the philosophy of mathematics, still today, very little known, but uh, I hope it will be uh, more known as we begin to advertise it uh, well enough. Uh, so, and uh, Russell at the beginning of the 20th century, 1903, 1918, produced then this fantastic uh, view, Anglo-Saxon view of uh, the wide variety of mathematics and the depth, uh, the, the important problems of mathematics of, of the moment and of the epoch. Then afterwards, in the turn of the century, things begin to, to decrease, and finally, the philosophy of mathematics in that tradition uh, it uh, produces something very strange at the end, in which uh, mathematics disappears from uh, from the from thought. Uh, we, uh, there are no reflections on mathematics. So I I was talking yesterday about this strange compendium, the Oxford Handbook on the philosophy of mathematics and logic, uh, which should better much better be called the Oxford Handbook on Secondary Anglo-Saxon Literature on the Language of Standard Sets and Logics. That would be correct, correct. and that would be very nice. I think that the, the problem is that they were not modest. Uh, they were thinking mathematics can be reduced to standard logics and sets and to language. That's a big crazy idea. So this, this kind of uh, not being modest enough in the Anglo-Saxon tradition has left uh, aside a lot of very important things, beginning by the very logic. If you are going to do a handbook on the philosophy of logic, at least, there should be the most important constructions of logic of the 20th century, which would be certainly model theory, and also logics which are far from being there and which are very important not just for, for us uh, being Latin American because they, they are very important in the sense of they are opening the mind like the paraconsistent logics of course but also the logic of shifts invented by my professor in Colombia Javier Caicedo. I would say that uh, the two greatest uh, logicians in, in, in the history of modern Latin American logic are certainly Newton da Costa and Javier Caicedo. The constructions that they, that they have done is, are really amazing. They are never mentioned in the handbook of the philosophy of logic. And neither are mentioned, I mentioned that, uh, the great Israeli uh, constructions by uh, Shela and Lushovsky, nor the gigantic invention of uh, modern uh, geometric logic by silver. So, all, all the, of the very exciting things that are happening in logic in the last uh, 40 years and do never appear in the supposedly handbook of the philosophy of logic. And of course, mathematics, we, that was extremely clear, I think, extremely well proved. Mathematics never appears. And uh, Galois and Riemann, the very masters of mathematics, of modern mathematics in the 19th century, that they still today have an enormous impact on the development of research, even today, are completely out of the question in the supposedly 
uh, philosophy of mathematics. So be a little more modest, and then that will be correct. Make an Oxford handbook for secondary, Anglo-Saxon literature on the language of a standard sets and logics, and that would be very good. And it's an excellent handbook on that. And the people who are doing that are extremely intelligent. And the, and the work is fantastic, very, very good, but very, very small, very modest. Be modest about what you are doing, unless you are a genius. If you are Gothenic, you cannot, you, you, you can be far away from modest. But uh, that usually doesn't happen. Yes, please. Uh, would you agree with my following provocation? If the name in classical logic was given by, was coined by the lack of modest of the Anglo Saxon world, would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, yes, I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, classical logic was not invented by Greek, nor by Chinese, nor by African, neither by French or yeah. Italian. <laughs> Mm, yes. Yeah. That, that, that's a problem. Uh, it's a problem of modesty that I think it's important for, 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 for that uh, school to, to be aware of, of modesty. And uh, about uh, modesty, we will talk today about a gigantic school, the school which produced uh, Glottendieck, which is the French school. It's a, it's a good counterpart to the, to the Anglo Saxon school that we were beginning to, to, to see yesterday, in which you have fantastic produce, producers at, at the very beginning, and also extremely interesting people at the end, but not doing philosophy of mathematics, not doing philosophy of logic, doing something very different, which is auto-reference, self-reference of the scholars, of the English scholars. That doesn't. It's something very strange. Mathematics is there. Then there is the language of mathematics. Then there is the self-reference of the Anglo school about language, about mathematics, mathematics completely disappears of the panorama. Okay, that's a tactic, but so you have to be aware of your tactic. Okay, so the, the French school is a very good, very good counterpart to that. Very nice counterpart. Why? Simply because the French school has been always, I'm talking about modern and contemporary. Uh, mathematics, modern mathematics coming from Galois on, from 19, 1830 until 1950, more or less, and contemporary mathematics coming from 1950 to today. So modern and contemporary mathematics have a very strong, very strong schools, we will mention them, but essentially the French have always been there from the very beginning until today. The French school is a fantastic continuous school from the very beginning of modern mathematics until today. And that is extremely clear when you see what mathematics has been produced by the French school and what are the field medalists. The, the influence of French school in the field medalists is gigantic. The other great school, which begins with modern and contemporary mathematics, is the German school, of course. The German school is extremely strong in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. But then afterwards, you know, with the, with the war and the, the, Nazi, the Nazi problem, uh, uh, the great mathematicians uh, emigrate uh, to, to the United States, something very good for the States, because at that moment, the United States begins to be another very high power in mathematics. So there is the continuity of the French, then there is this strong beginning, extremely strong beginning of the German school, which then is got, and now is beginning to, to, to take also a lot of force, but it, it's never the same as it was before, before the war. And there are also other important schools, then the, the American school, which is, is very strong from the 1930s on, or the Russian school, uh, Soviet Russian school is extremely important. It's probably most of the most uh, original field medalists come from Russia also. There is a very, very strong uh, understanding of, of the power of mathematics in Russia. And then there are other important uh, schools like the Italian school or the Japanese school, uh, 
uh, I would say the British school, very important, uh, uh, historical schools which are clear, and then there are the emergent uh, new schools like, uh, I would say, the Iranian school or perhaps the Brazilian school, right? Uh, th there are not so many gigantic schools on uh, traditions in mathematics, but there is one which was always there, the French, always there and still there. And it's still very important also for Brazil. Many of the most interesting mathematicians of the 50s came here to Brazil. Rodenig was one year in Sao Paulo, uh, Rail, uh, uh, Gironé, many of them. It was very important in the foundation of the mathematics department yeah. of the University of Sao Paulo. Yes, yes. The own fundamental. Fundamental, fundamental. So the, the, the Italian that, mathematicians too. Yes, no, the, 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 the Italian tradition is also a very important and very strong tradition at another level, but very, very important. So the French, the French are, are really something that we should care about. Uh, beginning our session today, I will show you a small quote by, by Goethe, which uh, explains this much better than anything that I will say today. A, a small quote by, by Goethe goes very far away. It's so fantastic that it, it, we could stop there. This fantastic quote by Goethe. Mathematicians are a bit like Frenchmen. When something is said to them, they translate it into their own language, and straight away it becomes something else entirely is completely true. The mathematician will be, you will say something to him, and then he will invent very strange images in his mind. The same happens with the French. You put them together, a French mathematician is something to take care of. It's something really, really deep, very important. I, I have seen the, the list of, of, the, of the participants, there is only one person from France. Very strange to me. Very, very strange. There should be a lot of French uh, people here because the, the tradition of, of France is fantastic. So let's take uh, care of, of Getty. Mathematicians are a bit like Frenchmen. Okay. He was entirely right. Let's begin then with this strange and fantastic tradition of uh, French mathematics. So we will be talking today about some of them, of some of the of the great uh, uh, thinkers about mathematics. I, I like to, to to call them thinkers about mathematics, not philosophers of mathematics. Philosophy is part of, of thought. Thought is much larger. In that larger perspective, there are very good thinkers of mathematics in the French tradition. I will talk about Poincaré, of course. Poincaré is probably the, the greatest mind in this, in, this, in this line. And then, very important philosophers of mathematics, which are very little known or not known at all, as uh, happened yesterday, we saw very little known, but still important. Much more important for the philosophy of mathematics than a Wittgenstein or a Wine or so many very big, important names, but which said very, very little about mathematics. These people really know what mathematics is about. And that's very interesting. We are interested in the philosophy of mathematics in this course, and the philosophy of mathematics and logic as part of mathematics. We are not interested in the self-reference Anglo-Saxon literature on language of standard sets and models. It's very respectable, very intelligent, but very, 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 very small, extremely small. Mathematics is something very big, and philosophy is even bigger something very big. You will not, and Lodman will, will say that very well, you should never accept 
simple particular things. You have to go beyond particularity. You have to look for something release which approaches the universal, like Cantor, for example, the greatest analytical mind. You should go beyond. Going beyond is something very important. These people went beyond. So the perspective that I will emphasize is not the only one that the, that the French have done, but the perspective is the counterpart with the with the analytical perspective that we presented yesterday, in which the object was looked by the composition, looking at the elements or the atoms, and then you have this natural construction which emerges from the decomposition in elements, which is a theory. Very natural. Extremely beautiful. Extremely profound. One of the greatest minds invented that. But it's just part of the question. Part of the question, please. Only part of the perspective. The other perspective is the, the opposite. Very natural opposite in the polarities of uh, main thought that I was presenting in, in our first uh, session, in which instead of looking at an internal object, object non-knowledge of an object, in which you can see inside, so there is some kind of a crystal and you can see inside, the other one is, you cannot see inside, it's a black box. And in that black, to understand that black box, you understand the relations with the environment. That produces then a composition of the, object, of the object using the information around the object, which is in fact what happens all the time in our life. In our life, uh, no one of us knows uh, himself or herself internally well, unless he has done a very, very good psychological studies. Usually, we all know what we are, but we know how we behave in society, and with that, people know us, and we know how we move in society. That's, that's a real life. And the left, uh, it doesn't exist in real life. The right is all the time, all day, all day, we are working on this kind of construction of representation of knowledge with relations, with functions, with the in category as called morphisms or arrows. Okay? So that's important. The, the contraposition is important and very, very natural. The, the, the construction of the mathematical tools to deal with the right part is called category theory. Category theory was mentioned today, the interest, the interest of understanding category theory, even to capture analysis. That's something fundamental. And the back and forth between them. If you stay only on the side of category theory, you will lose a lot. But of course, if you stay only on the side of the theory, you will lose a lot also. So both of them are important. And just taking in, 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 in mention the basic duality. Uh, it was mentioned that this is just the beginning. In fact, we have to think in a triadic way at least, and then afterwards in an adic perspective, this person has done that for years and years and years. So category theory. Category theory begins with a very simple but profound idea. This is something that I want also always to, to insist on. In mathematics, I think I'm not uh, entirely mistaken, the profound ideas are very simple. Very simple. If there is a profound idea that, that you cannot express in a very simple way, probably it is not profound. Probably it is not profound. If you have many, many, many layers of proofs to explain a little thing, probably that's not very profound. Simple things. One of the very simple things in category theory is that you have two layers of understanding. The layer of concrete categories, which are the regions of what, what David Corfield and many other people have called real mathematics, 
The real mathematics are the study of the varieties that we talked about. The varieties invented by Galois, the algebraic varieties, or the three great varieties invented by Riemann, differential varieties, topological varieties, complex varieties. Riemann is, is a mind which is beyond understanding for us. It's something completely intelligent. So you can never, we, you will never be able to capture a liter of the, of the profound things of mathematics if you would, don't go in one moment of your life to, to read directly Riemann, the construction of the, of the great varieties of the 19th century. So you have regions. You have a topological region, a differential region, a combinatorial region, algebraic regions, uh, lattice regions, uh, whatever you want, logical regions. Logical regions are part of the whole panorama, but it's a small part. Extremely important, extremely interesting. We are logicians, I, I am logician also, but I am also aware that logic is just a part of a gigantic panorama. And in this gigantic panorama, then you have concrete things which happen, which are happening concretely in the, in the categories. What uh, the, the invention of category theory, category showed was that beyond the concrete constructions, there is something more. There are universal constructions which are beyond the concrete. And that was a very, very simple idea that you can axiomatize the understanding of the regions, of the locals, through a global universal idea, which is just take seriously the quantifier exist unique. Probably existence and uniqueness are the one of two of the most important trends of mathematical invention. Usually the existence is fundamental, but also the uniqueness of a solution of a differential equation, etc. Existence and uniqueness are very, very important for the development of mathematics. If you take that uh, quantifier seriously, then you will axiomatize in an upper level the concrete local regions of mathematics. An example, simply, simple example for, for those who don't know category, but it, it, you should uh, quickly understand or read the basics of category theory because simply it's one of the most important inventions of the 20th century. You cannot uh, uh, say, go through the philosophy of logic of mathematics or even philosophy of language without going to at least make some acquaintance, calculus, exercises. We will ins insist on that in a moment, exercises on category theory. So let's think uh, the definition in universal terms of what is called an initial object. An initial object is something extremely simple in category theory. You cannot look inside. So you have this object, and this object will be initial in the category if for every other object of the category, you will find one and only one arrow from the initial object to the other object. That's an initial object, defined in the left, just by the quantifier exists unique. Now, that's a, an abstract construction. Now you go to the re concrete regions. The first one, set theory. You take the category of sets. What will be in the category of sets the initial object? It will be a, a set with only and only one function to every other set in the category of sets. You look at that, that's the empty set. So the empty set is the initial object in the category of sets. But now you change the region. You go for to groups, for example. And in groups, then you have groups here. What will be the initial object? It cannot be the empty set, because the empty set is not a group. So it will be the simplest group, the group with one element. And if you take here the group with one element, then you will see that if you take any other group, there is only and only one morphism in the category, that means homomorphisms in the other groups. Why? Because the neutral element should go to the neutral element by an, an homomorphism. So there is only one. So in sets, the initial object is the empty set. In groups, it's a group with one element. Now you change 
you go to rings, for example. You take go to commutative rings with unity. If you take commutative rings with unity, the rings will have a zero and a one. But if you have here a zero and a one, the homomorphism will carry all the all the all the all the all the, all the images of one plus one plus one plus one. So the initial object will be the one invented thanks to the one and the constructions of the one that makes you the ring of integers, etc. So you can see that the initial object, which was at the left, a universal construction, be, becomes in the concrete categories things which are completely different. An empty set, uh, and a, a set with one element, an infinite set in the category of rings. If you go to topological ambience, you will need here the discrete topology, etc., etc. I will not continue. If you go to the me to all the ordered sets, what will be? You can see an ordered set like a category in which the morphism exists simply if you have a, a, a relation between the, the two elements, less one less than the other. What will be the the initial element? The minimum of the of the theta. So you can see that appearances. That's my point. Appearances. Empty set. One element set. Uh, the ring of integers, uh, the discrete topology, the minimum, these are just appearances. There is something beyond that. There is something invisible beyond that. There is an archetype, fundamental world. There is an archetype beyond the different types. This is the beginning of doing serious metaphysics from a mental, mathematical point of view. Metaphysics is fundamental in the understanding of mathematics. It was supposedly erased from the tradition of analytical philosophy. Great, great mistake. Gigantic mistake from a philosophical point of view. So in categories, in this quick presentation of very basic things, you have this back and forth between the concrete and the abstract. That will give you, in the, the categories, strong techniques, a lot of beautiful techniques. Probably the most important theory in category theory is, is one which is very simple to state again, very, very profound. It's called the Yoneda Lemma. The Yoneda Lemma says this. If you have any category, any region of your world, if it's not a gigantic category, some category in which you have a, some, some kind of control on the size, then that category can be always embedded in a category where there are a lot of more, more of, of objects which are completing the, the first category. The category, the first category at left, in a sense, is discrete, and then it is completed through a lot of limits, just taking functors. There are three levels in category theory. First. The arrows, the relations uh, between the objects, then between categories. If you want to compare categories between them, you introduce functors. Uh, the introduction of functors is fundamental for the understanding of modern mathematics. Uh, the invention by Poincaré of uh, algebraic topology is exactly, exactly that. You want to understand the category of topological spaces through the category of groups. He invents homology and homotopy just to do that, and that's a fundamental functor, the functor of topologies on algebras. These things can be reversed by this man. So beyond uh, the category of discrete objects, there are functors. And if you look at uh, an object as a functor, then uh, that will be, give you a, a panorama of a, a complete understanding where you, where you have all limits. At the left, you have very little li limits. At the right, you have all limits, all possible limits in a categorical sense. So you are completing the category. And something which is interesting is that some of the, of the functors, which are called the representable functors, H sub A, come from objects. But a lot of them, 
the majority of them do not come from objects. They are something else. They are kind of phantoms. Tomorrow we will talk a lot about phantoms, about their, his phantasmatic imagination. Phantoms. The phantoms are already there. There is something beyond what we see. We can see an object, okay, but that's very little. There are lots of beautiful things around the object. This called, this is called the aura by Walter Benjamin. We will talk about Benjamin in our last uh, session, the, the latest uh, literary critic of the 20th century. The aura of the object is captured by the, by, by the functors around him, which are ideal constructions beyond what is supposedly our eyes. We have to, we have to go beyond what we see. And that is a constant construction of mathematics. The mathematician wants to go beyond what he or she is seeing. Yoned Alema, as happens also with history, all the time was not invented by Yoned, but by this man, by Grotendieck. Uh, only that uh, Mark Lane, uh, who was uh, uh, inventing in the category theory at the same time, a little before Gottendieck, uh, uh, McLean had this wonderful Japanese student, Yoneda, and he, he, meant, he invented the, he, the, the name for, for his students. But it was invented by Gottendieck before. That happens all the time. Uh, we have seen it uh, very well in, in the course by, by Gomez and Dottariano, the importance of, of history and how in history it will happen all the time that decades are lost, uh, centuries are lost uh, this, this morning. Uh, I, I, we, will think, we will think that this losing information is something which is related to ancient times. I would say, unfortunately, no. Uh, and we have here the, the very uh, sad stories about how Galois and Riemann have been completely forgotten in the analytics of the tradition. Completely forgotten. The most important mathematicians of the 19th century, they never appear. So it is not, it is not just uh, answering history and problem of documents. It's something very strange which happens with the prejudices of the human mind. I think that the mathematician, as part of his very way of being, has to fight systematically against any prejudice, against any dogma. That's something that the mathematician can do. And uh, uh, there is a strong tradition of liberty, of uh, freeness in the, 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 mathemat the mathematical mind. So mathematics is far away from just being a collection of technical terms. It's much more than that. It's something very, very deep, very important for the human civilization. Uh, there is this brilliant uh, historian of art of the 20th century, Pierre Frank Castel, one of the greatest historian of art in the 20th century, who said that uh, the two greatest polarities the greatest creative polarities of human thought are art and mathematics. It's completely clear. Art and mathematics is the greatest polarities, the greatest invention of human thoughts. So this inventive power of, of mathematics is something which uh, should be very important for, for us. So I will use uh, category theory in a part, and then I will use uh, shifts. Shifts for us will be like the key to our last session in which uh, we can produce uh, integral models for uh, the philosophy of mathematics in which all of, different, all of these different perspectives until now can be viewed together. You, can, you have to have the diversity, then you have to try to glue parts of that diversity in something more superior, more universal, more, more categorical in a sense. So we will begin with 
and Riemann again, and always Riemann. Riemann, the analytic continuation by, by Riemann, one of the greatest inventions of, of, mathematics, of the mathematical mind in the, in the, in the 19th century. I, I draw here a small definition that certainly most of you know very well, the Riemann set of functions. Fantastic invention by, by Riemann. In which you have this definition, usually uh, Euler uh, invented this for uh, S and uh, real beyond uh, one, then Chebyshev extended this for uh, S uh, complex whose uh, real part is uh, greater than one, and then uh, Riemann invented it for any complex number. The complex numbers appear here, and they will never disappear from mathematics. The most important, I would say, constructions of mathematics in history are the complex numbers. It pervades everything in mathematics. Very, very important. So what was the, the idea of Riemann? The idea of Riemann was we know how to understand that series in this part when S is real. And then here you have all the complex numbers. When S is real beyond one, and then he extended it to this part, and then Riemann extended it on the whole plane. How can you do that? You take this part, you extend it here, you extend it here, you extend it here, you extend it, and you continue extending it. You make what is called the analytic continuation. You continuate analytical in an analytical way this uh, function. You can do that. You will construct that for every complex number except one. There is a problem in one, but beyond one, you can make calculations of the zeros, what I call the what are called the trivial zeros of the set of function, which lie in the in the minus two, minus four, minus six parts of the of the real. And then there is this very strange part which is called the real part of S S S equal one half. Here you have zero, here you have one, here you have one half. The famous Riemann hypothesis says that all non-trivial zeros of the set of function lie in this line. Very simple to express. Extremely, 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 extremely difficult. You know that is the most important open problem still today in mathematics. Still today. Clearly, a very, very deep idea by, by Riemann. The consequences of the, of the Riemann hypothesis are very profound in many, many fields of knowledge, particularly in number theory. Many, many problems, difficult problems in number theory about natural numbers are related to the study of this complex function on the complex numbers, in which the analytic continuation is fundamental. And what is the idea? The idea beyond the simple idea, again, very simple definition, very difficult to look to put things about this simple definition, very simple idea of, of Riemann. You begin to extend your knowledge your local knowledge can be extended to the whole plane if things behave well in the intersections of the sequence. If here you have an information and here you have an information and in the intersection the, inter the, the information coincide, then you can extend. So you are going from the local 
to the global. That's exactly the idea of a shift. We will come back uh, to, to the particular definition of a shift uh, in, the, in my last uh, session. It's a very simple definition also, but the idea is here. The idea is already here. In the 20th century, you have two topological spaces, topological space on the bottom, topological space on top, a projection between them, and you want to go from the local section, the local uh, neighborhoods that you have on the bottom space to the connections in the global space, which are called the sections. So there will be a back and forth between locality and globality captured by the, by the shifts, and the shifts will capture this basic and simple idea. In some cases, not always, but in some important cases, locality can be glued to obtain globality. Something very important, I think, not only for mathematics, but for our world today. Our world today is very much in that fight against the local and the global. And usually, the, clearly the politicians don't know, but usually even the thinkers of today don't use the beautiful tools that mathematics has provided to understand this fight between the local and the global. Shifts are fundamental there. And I, as I will uh, forcefully try to show in, in my last uh, session, if you take seriously shifts, seriously, but always in a very simple way, if it is simple, it will be profound, the great French school. If you take that seriously, you will get a fantastic perspective for the philosophy of mathematics which goes well beyond the analytic, well beyond the synthetic, and in fact, will take care of what is happening in the middle. At the beginning, I was, uh, at the beginning of the course, I was saying, what is important beyond the polarities are the mediations. Those mediations are the continuous constructions of mathematics. There you have beautiful, Idea, uh, ideas of shifts uh, produced in bread. And the logic of shifts then appears in one moment, expanding our understanding beyond the classical logic, beyond the multivalued logics, or beyond the consistency, beyond intuitionism. The categorical logic and the logic of shifts provide general universal perspectives in which each of these is a particular case. Shifts are everywhere. They appear really everywhere. In every region of mathematics, you will have beautiful and important shifts, particularly in the field of algebraic varieties, in the field of complex varieties. It all emerges from complex varieties. The complex varieties by Riemann, if you take the analytic functions, the ones that I was talking about in my first uh, class, about uh, good holomorphic functions on a surface, if you take the germ, that is the class of equivalence classes of analytic functions, then you get the shift. Uh, the famous and very important Ringer presentation in the school of uh, Galois, Dedekind, Grothendieck, in which, if you want to understand the ring, what is the, the, the basic idea? You take like the, 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 the basic uh, constructions of the ring, which are called the prime ideals. The prime ideals gives you a set. You put a natural topology on those sets, called the Saristi topology, and on that space, which is the space of prime ideas with the statistic topology, then you get all the fibers to the top. We are talking here about the fibers. The fibers are the, the, sec, the, 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 the things which are lying on top of some kind of information. On the, on the bottom, you are taking the primes, the, the, the prime ideas of the ring, and then you take this topology, this basic topology in which essentially you, you are capturing that the right part of, of that variety. And then on the, on the fibers, you just take the local rings 
constructed by the primates. With that, you produce a beautiful and very important representation of rings. And in general, uh, you, will, uh, you will show me any kind of uh, particular region of mathematics. I will show you quickly chips are there everywhere. Even if they are not split, they are always hidden. And we know that they are, that they are hidden because Yoneda says so. Yoneda is saying that beyond what we are seeing, there is something profound. The phantasmata, I will call that next time, in our match together, you will see why Kepler is so important there. Very, very important. Not only a fantastic logician, certainly the greatest logician of the 20th century, but a fantastic mind, well beyond logic, well beyond mathematics, an incredible mind. So shifts are everywhere. The logic of shifts then should provide a lot of information. This is why I, I was mentioning at the beginning the invention of uh, Javier Caicedo in Colombia. For me, it is clear that the paraconsistent logic and the logic of shifts are the two greatest uh, inventions of uh, our continent in logic. They, this uh, this uh, great work of, of Caicedo shows that using this intermediate uh, logics between intuitionism and classicism, then you can get from that all the main important theorems of modern theory. Compactness, forcing, omitting type theorem, uh, under the understanding of the topology of models. Caicedo has done that for already two or three decades, in which he has proved very, very carefully that using the logic of this, you get to understand the whole perspective on modern theory. So, I will basically use this, these two ideas of uh, category theory that you have to think now synthetically, and then you have to open up your, your mind to the, to the idea of shift. Going back a little on the, on the perspectives, we will introduce here Poincaré. Well, Poincaré is certainly the master. We were saying yesterday that and the principles of mathematics of, by Russell has not been superseded. There has been nothing uh, better than, than the principles of mathematics by, by, by Russell in the, in the essay to produce a treatise on, on the philosophy of mathematics. The same thing we happened with Poincaré. Poincaré wrote a beautiful, not so long text on, the, on mathematical creativity, which is called L'Invention Mathematique. 1908. It's a very short treatise. It, is, um, it has been, of course, translated to, to English and I think uh, mo most of the languages, in which he, he explained extremely well how he invented mathematics. And uh, of course, you know, Pancaya was an, one of the greatest mathematicians of, of all time. In that uh, invention, Poincaré insisted on something very interesting for us, which is the pendulum part of, of understanding uh, mathematics. I call that the Pascalian pendulum, between imagination and reason, for my lecture, my dual lecture of reason, for reason and reason and for reason being in Spanish, for reason, if you take away the, the tilde in the, the middle. So this is this back and forth between intelligibility and sensibility is fundamental for Poincaré, in which he insists there is a free space of invention and there is a regulated space of proof. The two are fundamental. 
You cannot stay only on the side of the proof. You cannot stay only on the side of imagination and, and hypothesis. What is incredible in mathematics is that you go permanently back and forth between the vague initial imaginative idea and the very precise proof of that idea. That's, that's fundamental. The two parts are fundamental. If you stay only on the side of the proof, and if you consider, for example, logic, study of proofs, then you are leaving outside a lot of very important things. Well, insisted on that a lot. And he, he was extremely intelligent, as how intelligent people should be. So very critical of himself. And that's something that I consider a fundamental part of intelligence. If you are not very critical of yourself or of your environment, probably you are not so intelligent. Poincaré was extremely critical of himself. Very, very good in that sense. And he was perfectly aware of all the mistakes he had done in mathematics. But for him, that was fundamental. He insisted, we know, we understand, we invent through mistakes. And that is really, really fundamental for the mathematician. And that's why I think the only way to, to learn mathematics is through exercises all the time. You exercise your mind against something that you do not understand. You make a lot of mistakes. And from that, gradually, you begin to get some kind of clearness. But you go to that clearness thanks to the mistake. You go to that light thanks to the obscurity. That's fundamental for Poincaré. And it's fundamental, I think, for the understanding of mathematics. In here, he has, you have the, the circle of, of, uh, of Poincaré. You have some errors. You have some vague ideas. From that, you produce some voluntary efforts. These are all quotes from, from Poincaré, from the, from the L'Invention Mathematique, in which then you interrupt your, your efforts. Then you introduce analogies, familiarities which are unsuspected. And then, only then, you get some kind of hidden illumination, hidden relationship. And for Poincaré, the key of all that is that you get some kind of beauty, harmony, elegance, aesthetic feeling. Fundamental for, for Poincaré, fundamental for all great mathematicians. This beauty, this harmony, this, this kind of, of real connection with the, with, of things beyond what we can see always. So this fantastic definition of Russell, mathematics is the science of which we don't know nothing about. Fundamental, fundamental. Science that we don't know, there are mathematicians. The mathematicians go to that deep question, to that uh, hidden obscurity, and then try to illuminate that hidden obscurity. The back and forth between the two. A fundamental and quantum insists there is a circle there which produces civilization and which produces uh, mathematical truth and mathematical imagination. That I call that the geometry of creative, not only formation, but creative deformation. And there is something in mathematics for Poincaré which is central in that free space. A delicate sentiment and a special intuition, you have to sense. There is a sentiment. That sentiment is fundamental for the mathematician. If there is no, there is no sentiment, there will be no mathematics. Rational uh, constructions, very important. Just a part of the picture. Just a small part. La Evolución Mathematique, then, then, probably the greatest short construction in the history of uh, mathematical thought, in which someone, in this case, 
extremely brilliant mathematician, extremely brilliant physician, and extremely brilliant philosopher, was able to look at his mistakes and from that explain to the people how mathematics is invented. Should be a mandatory reading for any who is more or less interested in mathematics or more or less interested in philosophy. These ones are not mandatory readings instead. The following is the ones that I am going to, to present uh, very briefly. These are like very interesting and very brilliant philosophers of mathematics in the tradition of the, of the French school, which are seldom or not known. Albert Lodman. All, almost all of these also, as in the case of, of Russell, around uh, 30 years of age. Seems to be a very good uh, age to do beautiful things. So you are still in that good uh, line. We have ne nothing to do anymore, but people around uh, 30 years uh, should do things which are uh, very, very ambitious. To sense that uh, that uh, that feeling of uh, of uh, doing beautiful things, we, we, which will change your life and the life of the people around you. Lodman was one, one of them. Uh, he, he wrote his PhD thesis in in 1938, uh, around uh, 30 years of age, and before he was killed in the war by the Nazis in a concentration camp. And the essay sur la notion de structure et d'existence mathématique, the essay on the notions of structure and existence in mathematics, is his PhD thesis, a brilliant thesis in which, first of all, as with what will happen with all this school, the first thing that they, do, they did was to really look. If you want to do a philosophy of mathematics, there is no way. You have to look at the mathematics. You cannot stay at the level of language of mathematics or worse, second references about the language about mathematics where mathematics disappear. No, that's impossible. You want to do philosophy of mathematics, you have to go through the mathematics and you don't have to be a, a mathematician. Lodman was not a mathematician. He was an extremely bright mind who knew how to immerse himself in mathematics. That happens. That can be done. He is, for me, the, the greatest uh, philosopher of mathematics in the 20th century, uh, with good reasons that I will, if, if you're interested, after a while, so we can talk about. But he's some, someone who, who went really to, to understand what was happening in mathematics exactly in the period between Galois and, and uh, the beginning of Bourbaki. Lodman was a uh, friend of, uh, of the best Bourbakians, and uh, Delaunay, uh, Jacques Arbon, the, the great uh, uh, logician from France, which died also extremely young at 22, 23 years of age, and then the tradition of logic in France was cut uh, for a long time, now it has a and a good school now, but for for a long time in, in France there was very little or no logic. Jacques Herman was one of the of the greatest, and Lodman was uh, the best friend of uh, of Herman. Probably also, if you want to understand Jacques Herman and understand the proof of the of the, of the Herman theorem, you, you you read Lodman and you will understand. He he was very eager to go to the mathematics, so he knew extremely well his Galois, extremely well his Riemann, very, very good Hilbert, his, 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 mate, his master, very good Ebran, but also he was very aware of the basic fundamental traditions. So he, he has a rhythm of Plato which is extremely interesting for the modern world. He invented uh, two basic things between many, the idea of mixture between ideas, 
Okay. And the notion for the man is a polarity. It's exactly the name that he uses for a polarity in which you have something and the other. For example, the continuous and the discrete. These are two notions. Continuous and the discrete. And then there are mixtures between the continuous and the discrete. You can go, for example, in the Cantorian way, the set theoretic, the classical way, in which the continuous is constructed using the discrete. Through limits of the discrete, then you get the continuous real Cantorian line. That's a, that's a, a mixture. That's an idea that connects two notions. But you can go back and forth also. You can think, why? Why is that so? No, it shouldn't be so. What is important is the continuous. And then you take the Brauer, Brauer instance, in which you begin by the intuition of the continuous. And then after a while, you make cuts on the continuous, and then you get the discrete. So the back and forth is fundamental. And the ideas and the mixtures between notions is something that Logan uh, studies extremely well in all important in, uh, fields of mathematics, in the, in the field of Galois, in the field of Riemann, in the field of Hilbert. So he was extremely aware of what was happening in mathematics in that time, and he was able to explain in very simple terms, again, so profound, very simple thing, terms, what was happening in modern mathematics. No one, I think, still today, I think no one has done it better than him to understand the period in 1830 until the emergence of Woodworking. He is the great master to understand that period. Uh, I have worked a lot on Lotman over the years. In fact, uh, I have translated the, the whole the whole opus of, uh, of Lotman, and uh, not only the things which are in the, in the French uh, editions, but well beyond. Uh, I, have done, I have done a research on other on published manuscripts on Lotman, and I have translated all of them in my edition of Lotman in Spanish, which is also a, a pretty gigantic edition like this, a very large book, in which you can see that the Lotman was really something to, to be taken care of. Another person extremely interesting is Jean de Santin, 30 years after Lotman. That will happen if you, if you see the, the days after, after what in my, in my presentation. That will happen with uh, all this tradition. As I was saying, there is a continuous tradition of French mathematics, extremely strong, very, very strong. But there is also a continuous tradition of the philosophy of mathematics, very strong, not well known outside France. I would say almost unknown outside France, which is a pity. It should be very well known. Lodman has been finally translated to English, like uh, 10 years ago. De Santi was one of these, uh, these followers of, of Lodman. He studied this fundamental idea of the ideal that show, James Bernie show already in his small but very profound text, Ohio text, forgotten by the analytical tradition. It's, a, it's for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's a still a question, why was it forgotten? I think it was forgotten almost in purpose, but we have to, to, to take care about that. And the idealities. The, which is also one of the key ideas of Hilbert in his famous text, also a mandatory reading, I think, for all of young people here, the text of Hilbert on the infinite, one of the mandatory readings for anyone who is interested a little on thought in general, not just mathematics, not just logic, but thinking, real thinking. The, the text of Hilbert on the infinite, one of the greatest texts of, of, the, of that uh, period, in which he insisted mathematics goes always through the idealities. And uh, he, he was, 
so clever and so brilliant in, in that text, uh, Hilbert, that he almost produced, he tried to produce a proof of the continuum hypothesis. He couldn't, because we know that it's impossible, thanks to Weddell, but he was very close to prove it, and he introduced, before even Weddell, the idea of a recursive form. That's one of the greatest texts of, of uh, the history of mathematics, Hilbert on the infinite. No, no, can I say something? Yes, please. I translated in my book, Incompatibility, into Portuguese, directly from the German text. Okay, great. And it's completely different from translating from English into, into Portuguese. Okay. I translated from yes. German into Portuguese, then you see the real personality of a human. Yeah, writing. great, great. That, that, that's it's beautiful. a very beautiful translation. Yeah, that, that, that's beautiful. Uh, we know the, the, the capacity of uh, Walter Canieri with languages, something really amazing. He was showing me, for example, his text on, on Interlingua, in which uh, he is really trying to, to produce some kind of universality for uh, our understanding of mathematics beyond uh, Brazilian, beyond uh, Spanish, beyond uh, Italian, beyond French. Uh, something like trying to look for the universe. So, so uh, uh, I will be happy to look at uh, the Portuguese uh, translation. Great, great. That, that's the, those are the things that, 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 that are, should be mandatory for all the young people here, especially for the Brazilian ones, of course, but I think for all of us, for all of us. And uh, Santi insisted on many things, on phenomenology beginning by that. Uh, the Santi was a, a direct uh, a student of Merleau-Ponty. So there is a natural influence of Merleau-Ponty on mathematics, which is extremely interesting through the Santi, but also through another of the, of the great uh, phenomenologists of, of the 20th century, which is Giancarlo Rota, the great uh, professor from MIT, one of the uh, masters of the theory of combinatorics at the end of the 20th century. Giancarlo Rota wrote, uh, in fact, a beautiful text, which is called in a calambur, if I call it, well, the pernicious influence of mathematics upon philosophy. It's, it's a very, very witty and text in which he is saying the pernicious, pernicious influence of mathematics in philosophy is so because mathematics was reduced to the analytical perspective. If you reduce mathematics to the analytical perspective, that produces a pernicious influence on the philosophy of mathematics. He was very, very strong. I was a little strong yesterday. He was really strong. He was really strong against that book. But phenomenology for, for the Santi is, uh, is fundamental, coming from Merleau-Ponty, and then he will be the professor, uh, nonetheless, the, uh, of uh, Foucault. So there is, a, there is a, a, a beautiful line coming from Lodman to uh, Merleau-Ponty to the Santi to Foucault and to Deleuze. Deleuze is one of the greatest philosophers that and acknowledge explicitly the influence of Lodman. In his Difference Repetition, he goes explicitly to say, many of my fundamental ideas are coming from Lodman. Something not known. No. So there is this kind of understanding phenomenology of mathematics, the phenomenology of mathematics, which is fundamental also for us. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be a content with uh, looking philosophy of mathematics reduced to logic or reduced to language. There are many other dimensions. I, I have insisted on that. The multidimensionality of mathematical thought cannot be reduced to any part of the pendulum. All of them are extremely important, and particularly to understand the phenomena of mathematics. What are the phenomena, the real phenomena of mathematics? This is the guy, the Santi. This is a phenomen phenomenology of, of the real mathematics, which is extremely interesting. I will come back perhaps in, in my last uh, session. No, I will come back without the perhaps. I will come back to the idea of the phenomenology of mathematics 
uh, changed a little, but coming, in fact, from, from the scientific. And he had this beautiful idea that the mathematics is constructed through horizons, stratifications, in which you have ruptures, bakings of continuity. That bake of continuity, in many cases, produces some of the most important and interesting inventions. Chatelet. Chatelet is another one, 30 years later, again. Chatelet. Uh, died uh, before time. He committed suicide in, in one moment. moment. Uh, Chatelet insisted in something extremely interesting for us. Also, I will come back to him with more time. I, I, I will pass a little more because I want to speak a little about uh, this guy, Dr. Ndick. Uh, Chatelet introduced something very, very beautiful, which is the blind point in which to understand uh, some of the most interesting and most uh, uh, curious and profound uh, concepts of mathematics, those come through blind points, to things which are not clear. That blindness is related to the mistake in Poincaré, to the error, to the obscure part, which go back, which goes by, in fact, if you go back uh, to, to, to history, to Novalis another of those wonderful young minds that you should read as young people. Novalis, the, the great poet, was at the same time a very great philosopher. He, he wrote uh, in, in his very little time of, of life a beautiful, called, called, a beautiful Afo, collection of aphorisms called the, the Romantic Encyclopedia. And there you have this, uh, this uh, richness of unfolding of possibilities, the, the idea of understanding and the creative mind in the young novice. So let's come back at least 10, ten minutes, uh, yes, 10 minutes, say, on Grotendieck, and then I will be finishing with a small diagram after that. So Grotendieck. How can you resume Grotendieck in 10 minutes? Impossible, of course. Uh, but uh, we can begin saying that uh, Grotendieck is one of those fellows who follows in the school of shifts in, in France. The shifts were invented by, by Jean Leray in the, in the Second World War in a concentration camp, an example of, uh, of resilience of, uh, of, the, of the mind. And uh, afterwards, it was developed, developed, developed by, the, by the French school in the Col Normal Supérieure to, to the, the greatest mathematicians of the time, which were Cartan, Serre, uh, and Roth. So there is a, an, a school, an important school, which is behind Grotendieck, which is the French school on shifts. For me, one of the simplest presentations of, of Grotendieck is that he is perhaps the, the best and more profound, I recall that profound will be simple, the most profound and simple intersection between Galo and Riemann. You take the two greatest, it is clear that Galo and Riemann are the two greatest mathematicians of the 19th century. Why? Because today, again, we are developing a lot of tools to understand the, the first intuitions of both of them. They are today still extremely important, almost 200 years after Galois. So it's, it's a kind of uh, nonsense to do, to try to, to say that philosophy of mathematics can be done without looking at Galois. It's impossible. It doesn't make any sense. So on one side, you have Galois and the algebraic varieties, which are invented to understand number. And on the other side, you have Riemann and the differential varieties, which are invented to understand the magnitude. Discrete and continuous, the basic polarity. How to go deep in that? One of the, of the, of the ways is the riemann roch theorem, which we began. But the deepest one is the invention by Grotendieck. 
We will talk about that with more time in our last session, which is the idea of the talks, in which you can encompass at the same time the algebraic discrete term and the continuous theme. If you put them together, then you construct one one height, one side schemes, and after the schemes, the tops. Schemes were invented around 1958 and the tops around. Uh, 1962 and 1963. I will present briefly the top bosses in my last uh, lecture, and you will see again, and I hope it is very clear, that it's extremely, extremely simple. Very, very simple. The idea of a top boss, but very deep. If you go to, to through the work of uh, of uh, Grothendieck, then you will have this back and forth between the abstract and the concrete. He invented very abstract universal constructions, but always to answer very concrete problems. His invention of schemes and toposes were not just an abstract invention of, of a great universal mind, but he wanted to solve the Bell conjectures. And the Bell conjectures are to understand this Freeman set a function not on the complex plane but on finite extensions of, of the rationals, final extensions of, of uh, finite fields. So that exists also in not only in the continuous world but also in the discrete world. The Veil the conjectures by Andre Veil, not to be confused with Hermann Weil. We will talk about Hermann Weil tomorrow, the great disciple of, of Hilbert, Andre Weil, the conjectures of, of Weil in 1948, tried to explain what is happening in that discrete extension, and you can do that with the set of function restricted to extensions of finite fields. So that was a very important problem in the 1950s. Uh, Grothendieck invented expressly very, very big universal tools to solve that particular problem. A very particular problem. That's a good example in which both of the perspectives are very, very important. You cannot state the veil conjectures unless you are very, very fine in the analytical reading. You have to be very good in the analytical reading and then when you have done that, then you need the synthetic universal perspective to solve that very particular problem. That's something that Grothendieck did against all the imagination of the community. The community was completely up and bewildered by, by, by Grothendieck's work. And he, he invented a lot of beautiful and very important concepts using the idea of a shift. The schemes in which you generalize algebraic varieties to the categorical context, toposes in which you, you generalize the intersection of uh, set theory and algebraic geometry to a universal context, motives in which you generalize what is happening in number theory to very general context, and he goes on and on. I am just putting here what is more known about uh, the, the, the class, the usual Grothendieck between 19, his PhD thesis around uh, 1949, and then uh, when he departs the community in 1971. If, if you're interested, we can talk about uh, that particularly and profound personality of, of Grothendieck afterwards. Uh, so, but that's just a part. This is the part which is uh, more well known in the in between the first two dec decades of Grothendieck. Then Grothendieck left uh, for a little time mathematics, then came back very strongly between 1980 and 1990, and he invented a lot of beautiful ideas, in particular one of very, of very strong, very powerful, very universal idea which is the idea of derivators. 
in which we have here the, the chance of having between you and Tiago Alexandre is a, a, a great mathematician. He has done a beautiful master thesis on, on the derivatives, and he's now trying to axiomatize a large understanding of, of derivatives in his PhD thesis. The idea of, of Grotendieck was impressive. It's incredible. You have this way of understanding and the topology, thanks to Poincaré, to the homology groups, in which you take some kind of linear covering of the space, or to the homotopy groups, in which you try to understand the space through loops on the space. So linear coverings, loops on the space. Are they related? They, they, they are related, it is well known. Those are some of the important themes of algebraic topology, but they were always thought as two different things. The great mind, so no, there is something beyond that, something more profound that we are not seeing. Why? There are a lot of reasons, but we are not seeing that universe. That universal is a derivator, and from that you can get homology and homotopy and a lot of other things. A great mind beyond our usual perspectives. And then, Grotendieck did something similar to, to what Poincaré had done, to think about himself. He explained, but in the Grotendieckian way, how mathematics is created, how mathematics is invented. Poincaré had the capacity to produce a 15 pages around the invention mathematique, which is the synthesis fantastic of what should be a mathematical creation. Grotendi was impossible to write. He always wrote gigantic things. So the Recolte Semai, famous text on, on his mathematical invention, takes a thousand pages. So you have to be patient. You have to have time, and then you have to have a little desire of understanding. Time and desire, a little heart, will give you one of the best approaches ever written on mathematics. That's very interesting, beautiful, very recommended. It has been translated also into English, into Spanish, into many languages. It, but you have to be patient. You cannot uh, pretend to understand Grotendieck in one week, one year, not in 15 years, not in your life. It's impossible. This is a, st a stupid essay to produce a guide. It's impossible. impossible. It's, it's, some, it's someone that will, will live forever for generations. It's uh, the, the Riemann of our time. Someone who really, really understood mathematics. And uh, here we have this, uh, this something, the beautiful text, in, in which he is, as Poincaré was, extremely critical of himself. That's the only way to understand things. You have to be extremely critical. Never accept anything. And so I finish with this picture which is very different from the picture of yesterday in which if you remember the picture of yesterday we were folded on languages syntaxes descriptions and analysis as a part of the world but we were certainly folded there the unfolding the great imagination of mathematics was not there and it is here in this tradition. The French tradition captures that better than anyone. Very, very good tradition to understand what really mathematics is about. And again, it's perfectly respectable. Very, very difficult. You need extreme intelligence to do philosophy of secondary Anglo-Saxon references on the, on the language, of a standard sets and logics. You need a lot of work there. 
but ju that's just a very, very small part of the world, an extremely small part. Small part. If you want to begin to understand a little of the picture, then you have to go again against that. And then but go back and forth between the two traditions. This is what I will try to do in my last uh, presentation. But these things which were completely out of the question in the analytic tradition appear here as the center of our thought, of our reflection. Creativity, that's the important thing. Mathematics is important because it's one of the greatest creations of human mind. And there you have these kind of mixtures. You have horizons, you have blind points, you have virtualities, and then you have this. You cannot escape from modern mathematics. You have to, to go through number theory, to abstract algebra, to topology, to differential equations, complex variables, please. You cannot escape complex variables. That's really, really the heart of mathematics. Functional analysis, the inventions of Hilbert, etc. This begins to answer, in a small way at least, what, some of the questions that I posed in the in the first uh, in our first lesson. The polarities and the mixtures, the constructions between the polarities. If you are interested in a space and number, really interested in a space and number, you have to go through algebraic topology, you have to go through algebraic geometry, you have to go through uh, topological uh, perspectives. There is no way to escape that. It's fundamental. And that is extremely well captured by shifts. Because shifts are just, and I will come back to that on my last session, and I am finish, not finishing now. If you take shifts, and you look at the fibers of the shifts, depending on the information that you have on the shift, then you will have the basic construction of relativity. This, the abelian categories are shifts in which the fibers are abelian groups. The schemes are shifts in, what, in which the fibers are rings. Toposes, which will be our fundamental construction in the last session, are shifts in which the fibers are just sets. We will see the importance of that. And then, if you take shifts in which the fibers are algebraic extensions, in the sense of Galois and Dedekin, then you will get the, the motifs. And with that, you get a unified perspective of at least, at least, beginning to understand the fights, the fundamental fights of mathematics. Mathematics fights to see what we cannot see. Thanks. I imagine that we have a small, little time for, for a question. If you are interested in one. Yes, please. Uh, what is your you, you are supposed to come here. <laughs> or, or, uh, or talk uh, very loud. <laughs> uh, maybe I will try that. Uh, so I will try to talk harder and it's okay. very Please stand up. Everybody wants to, to see you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is, I mean, if somebody, if somebody doesn't hear me, I'll come. Okay. So first of all, thank you for the talk. I uh, very much like the fact that you emphasize the distinction between the the internal, like this internal, like local approach to, to, to concepts, so to speak, versus the external concept that is like this global uh, approach that we use in, in logic and mathematics also. Um, and like uh, the, the fact that in some theory we use this internal, internal approach that we kind of we have a concept and then we re reduce it to a set. And to see, and then we see what's inside. And like in category theory, we use this like external approach where we actually like have we define a concept by giving some sort of rules, right, on how to use it. So what what I'm getting from your question yeah. <laughs> right now? 
So um, I question is like because you mentioned Wittgenstein and his papers, and I was just wondering. You said like that basically Wittgenstein didn't say much about philosophy of economics. So I, I agree. I agree. But but however, I was just wondering, like because you didn't mention the investigations, and in the investigations, Wittgenstein talks about his view on meaning and about how meaning is in use. So would you consider that this view could be connected to this external <laughs> approach, like in Pythagorean theory, that's like, and also in improved theoretic semantics. That's like we categorize, for instance, we can categorize the product, like by giving this, uh, by, by the projection morphism and, and morphisms and by the, the operations on them. And that, that is the same, like we can use this to characterize conjunction also. Like, uh, versus like in the eternal approach where we just say, oh, conjunction is just a function. It's, 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 it's a function. So I was just wondering, uh, like, would you agree or, or not, maybe, I, I don't know. Like, what's your, what is your opinion of this, that like Wittgenstein too is maybe closer to this, to this external approach to Thank you very much for the question and the comments and, and the good explanation about uh, the Christian and the black box that it's uh, very good to repeat it all, all, all the time. So I agree completely with you. In fact, uh, when I presented very quickly yesterday Wittgenstein, I, I, I presented the pendulum between the Tractatus and the remarks on the foundations of mathematics. In the Tractatus, you have this internal perspective, and clearly in the remarks on the foundations, then you have this external perspective in which what is interesting is the action of the community, the game, etc. So that's that's extremely clear, important. Why? Again, by, by I may be entirely mistaken, but I think that the great minds go beyond any classification. And Wittgenstein was certainly a very, very great mind, an extremely interesting philosopher, extremely interesting thinker, an extremely interesting logician, not a very good mathematician, but that's normal. He hasn't um, to understand mathematics, no problem, perfect to be that. And in, in, that, uh, in that mind, that fantastic mind of, of Wittgenstein, he has the ability to go beyond any reductionism, even of himself. He is the, crit the greatest critic of Wittgenstein, he is the very good Wittgenstein. That's something uh, which shows real genius, as I was saying at uh, one moment. If you are able to make a strong critic of yourself, then you are beginning to be an intelligent person. Begin. And then you have to, to produce the work which shows that critical capacity. I will come back strongly to the idea of criticism at the end in my last uh, presentation, in which critics is, the, I think, the real thing that we have to do in mathematics. We will talk about that uh, at uh, the very end. But I agree completely with you. Thank you very much. And in fact, also, uh, this uh, trend of the synthetic Wittgenstein has been very well studied by Lambeck. Joachim Lambeck, a great uh, categorist from, from uh, the Canadian school, he has done beautiful things about uh, synthetic uh, grammars, which are very close to what was uh, Wittgenstein. Thank you. Please. Uh, I think that you have to stand up and, and, <laughs> and shout. Even if you look to Karl uh, during the 50s, when he published Empiricism, Semantics, and Ontology, he started to accept the distinction between internal and external questions, like external questions are pragmatic questions. And yeah. so both are interconnection if we look also to the principle of tolerance. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, even Karl, uh, I don't know if, of course, he was a, uh, like a parameter of the analytical and but yes. even current, I think that he can be a charity yes. to him. And yes, a lot, a lot. A lot. That, that's why also I, in one moment I, 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 I tried to be as strong as possible, uh, saying in a polemic, but I think not so far 
uh, uh, away from truth that uh, the great minds are essentially not reducible to one current. The great minds are usually capable of seeing the limits of their own thoughts and their, their, their own doctrine. That happens with the great minds. It doesn't happen with us. <laughs> That's the problem for me. It's an important problem for us, which are, I, I don't think, perhaps there is here a young genius. It usually doesn't happen. A genius, it's very seldom happening in, in, in the world. It happened with Wittgenstein, it happened with Russell, it happened with Grotendieck, but these are really big, big, big persons. We are very normal persons. And these very normal persons have not that capacity of thinking really profoundly. So even if we are not capable of that uh, deepness, we should be aware, we should be really aware that we are very little things, very, very small things, and not try to introduce our very little things of our mind as a dogma in other little minds. That's my fight. Great fight against analytical philosophy is that. Not against Russell, not against Karnak, not against Wittgenstein. Yes, against my analytical colleagues. Yes, fight against them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, please, I tell <laughs> Me, I tell you a, a very interesting story yes, please. relating Newton da Costa and Juan Carré. Yeah. And uh, our Portuguese book uh, has an appendix with some interviews. The English book will have 50 interviews with logicians of the century related to development of our consistency. Salamé is one of the professor who gave us a very beautiful interview for the English book. But uh, 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 Archibano Micali was uh, a good mathematician, Brazilian mathematician, who developed his academic life in France. He studied in Brazil, who went to France to take his PhD. Uh, uh, in one of his, uh, he came to Brazil when we celebrated here at Unicamp the 80th anniversary of Newton da Costa. And he gave his interview uh, to Evandro here. And he told a thing that nobody knew. When he had begin, begun his uh, PhD in France under Pierre Samuel, a great French mathematician, he came to Brazil during his first holidays and he went to Curitiba uh, to work with uh, Jaime Cardoso, who was teacher of us here, and also was a colleague and teacher of Da Costa in Curitiba. And there, he knew Newton Da Costa during the seminars, when Newton Da Costa used to present his first ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Archibano Micali liked it very much, but he was, also, uh, he was a young student in, French, in France. But he suggested that Newton uh, had to write the paper in French, that he would uh, take the, the, the paper uh, to Montpellier. Mm -hmm. And he helped Newton to write his first paper, the first one published in the world in French. The paper the published in 1963 before uh, before the presentation of Newton da Costa's uh, thesis on uh, systems for inconsistent formal systems. Uh, Archibald Micali went to France and presented the paper to his, uh, to Pierre Serre and to uh, Marcel Guillaume that in the 60s came to Brazil and spent a time in Curitiba working with Newton. Michel Guillaume, Marcel Guillaume had just finished his PhD under Berne, under Berne. Uh, 
when uh, Archibald, he told this in his interview, he, he took the paper and Mich Marcel Guillaume liked it very much and presented the paper uh, uh, and decided that the paper would have to be presented at the meeting of the Académie, Académie des Sciences de Paris. Mm -hmm. And the paper was presented, uh, Pierre Samuel helped, was presented to the, to the meet at the meeting of the Academy by René Garnier, and the paper was presented. And then they tried to publish the paper. But the editor of the Comte Rangi, the, the publication, uh, the, the official publication of the Académie de, de Sciences de Paris decided, claimed that the paper could not be published. The title of the paper was Système Formel Inconsistent, Inconsistent Formal Systems. And in the paper, uh, it was discussed the possibility of the existence of formal systems, inconsistent formal systems, without triviality. And the editor and the community said that it is not possible to publish the paper, this is in the interview, because the word, the term, inconsistent, was not a term of the French language. It was not acceptable. Then, Marcel Guillon decided that this was not acceptable. And then he became looking, looking, uh, uh, all the publications before the 1960s, looking for uh, some paper where the word inconsistent appeared. appeared. And then he found in a paper by Poincaré at the end of the 19th century, a paper where Poincaré had used the term inconsistent. And then the paper by Milton da Costa was published by the Comte de huh. And this is an very interesting interrelation between Milton da Costa and Poincaré. Beautiful. <laughs> I, I think Poincaré was actually a really bad user of English also. Uh, he, he used logistics instead of logic. So he had some funny ways of using it. But until now there are people who use logistics. But this is very interesting. Poincaré had used it. This is in our book, in English. But what is that in language is determined by uh, but there's a phrase, the, the grace and the many, and then for the is great, so that, that's a better term. Let's use logistics. <laughs> Well, thank you very much.